Uh, for our sermon text today, we consider R Romans chapter 12. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, in view of God's mercies, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ and individual members of one another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them, if prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be genuine, abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good, Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal, but fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in, in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep, live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. We pray. These are your words, Heavenly Father. Sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord our rock and our redeemer. Amen. You may be seated. In the name of Jesus Christ, dear fellow redeemed. So now in chapter 12, Paul takes up the topic of what we call sanctification. Sanctification is what we do. He has spent the first 11 chapters basically on the subject of justification, what God has done for us, that God has in fact declared us not guilty, through faith in the blood atonement in the work of Jesus Christ alone. But in order to introduce this subject of sanctification, let me talk about uh, the therefores that we have found in the first 11 chapters of Romans. So, this is basically what God has been saying in the first 11 chapters. First three chapters, he has been saying to us, you're sinners, but I have loved you, therefore I sent my son. And my son went to the cross, bled, and died. Therefore, all sins are forgiven. And I, as God, want you to have this gift of forgiveness, which you cannot receive by your own reason or strength, Therefore, I will give you the gift of faith by which you receive this. And since all of this from beginning to end is done by me, God, therefore the reality is I have called you, I have elected you to come to faith, to be preserved in the faith, and never to fall away no matter what happens. That you will be preserved no matter what happens in your life. So these are the therefores, and you'll notice that all these therefores are really mercies of God. Beautiful, wonderful mercies of God. 
And there is one more therefore that we find in our text for today. And so what Paul is doing here is he's saying you have all these mercies in chapters 1 through 11. God sends his son, he pays for our sins, he brings us to faith, he's elected us so that nothing can separate us from the love of God. And then he says again here in chapter 12, verse 1, therefore. But what is it that this therefore is? What follows this, this therefore? This therefore that is in fact the basis for our Christian life, for our sanctification. What is it? Well, obviously, what follows this therefore is not that we say, all right, let's go out and sin all we want. That doesn't make any sense. And Paul says what follows this therefore does make sense. It's reasonable is what the word says in the Greek. Um, you could compare it to um, a man giving you a million dollars because you're desperately poor, and then you say to yourself, well, I've got to thank this man. And how can I thank him? Well, you obviously would not say, well, I'm going to thank him by going out and doing everything contrary to what this man stands for. No. What follows the therefore, what follows these mercies, what we do in view of these mercies is reasonable. It leads to a reasonable worship or a reasonable service is what the Greek originally says there. So again, let's, let's look at these words. I appeal to you therefore, brothers, in view of God's mercies. And here's what follows. To present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. So, what follows the therefore is you and I presenting our bodies to God as a offering to God, a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, pleasing to God. In other words, what we're supposed to do is we're to take the law of God, the Ten Commandments, which convicted us of sin, and we're now to use the law of God also as a guide as to how we are to live, how we are to thank God for what he has done for us in Christ. And we also see here in this text that this holy, acceptable life begins here. Paul talks about the renewal of the mind. And some of us can understand this a little bit better than others. Um, I think most of us here, you've probably been Christians throughout your life from the time you were baptized as an infant up until now. Uh, some of us, others, have, have uh, come lately or perhaps fell away and then come back. And I know that when I was uh, reintroduced to the gospel of Jesus Christ uh, at college, um, I still remember so vividly how God, through the gospel and through the mercy, through his mercies, began to transform my mind. It was quite amazing. And I began to think in uh, Christian categories and in so many areas of life. And it was just really quite amazing. I'll, I'll never forget that. All of a sudden, I... I start asking myself, you know, what good can I do? I start asking myself, how can I live in view of God's mercy? I start asking myself, how can I obey God? How can I now use God's law as a guide for how I ought to live? Now, um, I don't say that to, to brag because uh, there's very often uh, two dangers that accompany this, two pitfalls that accompany this. And I fell into both these pitfalls. Uh, one, I became what's called a pietist. A pietist is just another way of saying a self-righteous Pharisee. That was very irritating to a lot of people, probably especially my family. Um, I had a right, everybody else had a wrong. <clears throat> very irritating. And the other pitfall I fell into was uh, I became quite depressed over time. 
Why? Because the law of God always, always accuses. It always convicts. And even though the law of God is there to guide the Christian, the law of God, and and ought to guide the Christian, uh, the law of God cannot by itself improve me. The law of God by itself cannot make it happen. The law of God cannot deliver on what it tells me to do. Only the gospel can do that. And since the law always accuses, always convicts, it's important for the Christian to remember that the law really can offer absolutely no comfort and no strength to do what it commands. Only the gospel can do that. And so as a, as a new Christian, I really became focused on the law. And that focus drove me to become a Pharisee and, and drove me to this, this burden produced by the law. The gospel of Jesus Christ, the mercies of God, are not only what we need when we first become a Christian. The mercies of God, the gospel of God, is also what we need every step of the way as a Christian. And that's because the old Adam is always there in this life. And that's because our default mode is still, I can do it, but we can't do it. And so we need the gospel. We need the gospel, the forgiveness of sins, to comfort us and to strengthen us. And so we can live in view of his mercies. And so now we, as Christians, live in this therefore mode. God sent his son. God had his son pay for all our sins. God brought us to faith. God elected us in Christ. These are all mercies. Therefore, we offer our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. And we do so every week. You are poor, miserable sinners, not only before you were baptized, but last week and right up through today. And you are poor, miserable sinners who have been completely forgiven by the blood of Christ, not only way back when you were first baptized and came to faith and were converted, but also yesterday and today and tomorrow and next week. And so this is the cycle of the Christian throughout his life. The mercies of God are my comfort, but they also become my motivation and my power to be a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. As the Apostle John said, we love because he first loved us. And so Jesus Christ, because of his blood shed on the cross, not only wipes away all our sins, he's not only our Savior, but it's very clear from Scripture that he also becomes our example. St. Peter put it this way. Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth, When they hurled insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. And so now... The law that convicts us day after day after day 
and will continue to do so. That law also now becomes our guide. It says here is how we are to live in view of God's mercies. And so when we look a little later in chapter 12 here, we see Paul explaining to us vocations and how we are to take the, the law of God, the commandments of God, and say, in my vocation, this is how I am to live. He talks about a vocation of prophecy, which is the public ministry, a vocation of service, a vocation of teaching, of exhorting or encouraging, of contributing, a vocation of leadership, a vocation of mercy. And what we see in the other epistles, like Colossians and, and uh, Philippians and Peter's first epistle, we, we see there that they talk about other vocations as well. And it's very clear that we are to take the law of God, the commandments of God, and use them as a guide in our other vocations. And the ones they mention are things like husband and wife, uh, father and mother, son and daughter, employer, employee, citizen, uh, government official. Take the law of God and use it as a guide as to how we relate to our neighbor in all these different vocations in our lives. And it's very clear also from Romans 12 here, it's, it's just not an outward thing. It's not just a mechanical thing that we do or don't do, but it's from the heart. Listen again to verses 9 through 13. Love, let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Now, a question we could ask here also is, you know, how much is the law of God to be our guide? To what extent? And the answer is fully. To the full extent. He, Paul and Peter both give us the example of Christ and his moral, perfect life. And he says that's our goal as Christians. And to make this point even more clear, Paul at the end of this chapter here talks about loving our enemies. And this is very hard, very hard. Many of us, if not all of us, have experienced bitterness in life towards somebody who has offended us. I've had to deal with spouses who are unfaithful to each other. I've had to deal with a woman who was sexually molested by her father, and then her father rallies the family around him to persecute her. Talk about reasons for bitterness and hatred. And yet we are to, to love our enemies. Do we fall short? Yes. And so here's that problem again. The law of God that is to guide us in how we are to live and how we are to relate to one another, even toward our enemies, is also the law that accuses and convicts and even if Paul is telling us, use the law of God as a guide, many times it comes back and it accuses us of our sins. Does that mean we're not Christians? No. It means we have the sinful nature. And so here is what we ultimately need to hear and remember. Going back to Romans chapter 5. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners still enemies. Christ died for us. And so as Christians we will find that the law always accuses, always convicts us. But God's mercies always trump our sins. God's forgiveness always goes deeper than our sins. And so, 
Today, we offer ourselves as living sacrifices to God in view of his great mercies. And therefore, that means we, we let the law be our guide in every vocation we have to the full extent it should. That's what we do this week. And then what? Well, we'll have to see you back here next week. And we will place before you once again God's mercies in Christ. Amen. Please rise. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forevermore. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.